As much as Hollywood loves to portray poker as icy staredowns and big ballsy bluffs, the reality is is that this game has a ton of math baked into it. And the sooner you understand that and learn some very basic math principles, the easier and easier this game is going to be. And honestly, any poker pro who's worth their weight is going to understand at minimum these basic math principles and be able to do a decent chunk of this at the table. So today I want to explain what those are with you, break it down, do a couple exercises, and get right into it. So let's get started. Good morning, how are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, AK Split Suit, and today I wanna to talk about some basic poker math with you and really make sure that you understand these principles because honestly, every single solid poker pro that you know understands these things and most of the time is doing at least these basic calculations at the table. So let's fire right into it. The first concept we're gonna talk about is pot odds and pot odds are extremely simple. If you've been around poker at all, you've probably heard this term a tremendous amount, but a lot of players may throw the term around but not necessarily be able to define it or calculate it all that easily. So let's go through a quick exercise together. All right, so this is directly from my prefop and math poker workbook, and here's the situation. You're on the turn with a 16K pot, your opponent bets into you, and you're going to do some general calculations of pot odds down below. And pot odds, in case you're looking for a basic definition, simply compare the size of the bet you have to call to the size of the pot. They are a mathematical expression of risk and reward that can then be used to make better plays both prefop and postflop. So pot odds are offered anytime you face a bet, face a raise, it's regardless of what your overall cards are, those don't impact anything. So if you're ever facing a bet or raise, you are getting pot odds. If you ever make a bet or raise, you are giving your opponent pot odds. So let's just burn through these real quick. And if you are familiar with pot odds, maybe pause here real quick, do the basic calculations, come back and make sure you did everything right. But here's the spot. Again, 16K in the middle, your opponent bets for 4K. So the total pot rate this moment would be 20K, right? 16 starter plus the 4k bet from them so the percentage of pots that they are betting right there is 25 percent because they're betting four into 16 so one fourth your pot odds at that point are going to be five to one and that's because you're if you're thinking about what you're risking you are risking one unit so the 4k unit and what are you risking that for you're risking that for five times that the 16k in the middle plus their 4k bet equals 20 in the middle so you're risking one unit to win five units that's the way that i would think about pot odds and I think if you're looking at ratios that's the best way to think about them and if you're looking to understand what your equity requirement is based upon that ratio it's always risk divided by risk plus reward so in this situation one divided by one plus five or one over six or roughly 17 percent moving on to the next situation where our opponent bets 8k again into a 16k pot they are betting at that point 50 percent of the pot the ratio at that point would be three to one right because we are risking our 8k call to win the 24k in the middle the 16 plus their 8 so that gets 3 to 1 and then the again equity requirement is going to be risk divided by risk plus reward so 1 divided by 3 plus 1 or 1 over 4 or 25 percent and then jumping down to the last one if they bet 12k again into that 16k pot that is 75 percent of the pot our ratio at that point would be 2.3 to 1 and the equity requirement at that point 1 divided divided by 3.3 or roughly 30%. And because anytime you face a bet or face a raise, you are getting pot odds, it's very, very important that you have this formula understood. And honestly, you can memorize quite a few of these. If you just kind of memorize, okay, if I'm facing 25% pot or 50% pot or 100% pot, that will really, really help you just kind of be able to estimate things in real time. You're not gonna try to go down to a hundredth of a percent when you're doing these kind of calculations in real time. Just kind of being close and in the ballpark is definitely going to help. And really the way that you want to look at this is you say, okay, based upon the pot odds, what is the equity requirement that I need right this moment in order to justify continuing? If you think your hand has that much equity, continue. If not, eh, maybe not, but you could always at least consider a raise hint. The next concept we're going to talk about is called break-even percentage. This is extremely important and also very simple to calculate and understand. So unlike pot odds, when you're making that calculation when you are facing a bet or a raise, break-even percentage looks at times when you are actually the one making the bet or the raise. So let's flip back to the workbook and go through another example together. So we have kind of a similar situation. We have a spot. The pot right this moment is 800 bucks this time. You are the one betting and you're going to calculate the break-even percentage based upon 
upon a couple of different bet sizes. So let's first start by talking about the 310 bet size, and this is roughly 40% of the pot, and then we have to calculate the break-even percentage as well. And if you wanted to be very, very specific, you could just fire up a calculator, say 310 divided by 800, that's going to be the percentage of pot, which is roughly 39%. Let's round it there, make life easy. And then the break-even percentage is going to be, again, that risk divided by risk plus reward number. So 310 divided by 310 plus 800, or you can use my spreadsheet, easy calculator that I have available for free. I'll leave a link for that in the description box. The reward is 800, the risk is going to be 310, and the break-even percentage comes out to 28%. And again, you can proof all of that out by using that formula, risk divided by risk plus reward. All right, and while we're here, let's do another example on this page. Let's look at a $1,600 bet, aka a 2x over bet in this situation. Well, we're betting 1600 into an $800 pot, so we know that's going to be 200% pot. Perfect. And then the break even percentage, again, risk divided by risk plus reward, or 1600 over that 1600 plus 800 gets us a break even percentage of 67 or two thirds. And if you're looking at these two numbers and you're like, okay, I understand how to calculate the break even percentage, but what the heck do I do with that number? That is going to bring us to our next concept auto profit. So auto profit simply compares how often you think your opponent's going to fold to the required amount of folds from that break even percentage. So if your opponent is folding more often than the required break even percentage, they are folding too much. And as such, you can make an auto profit by betting any two cards, which is great, especially when you're trying to find extra bluffs in your game, both preflop, but especially post flop. All right. So if we flick back to the workbook and try to apply this, let's just say for whatever reason, you think your opponent is going to fold 40% of the time when you fire in this spot. Don't worry about what assumptions went into that, just take the number for a moment. So when you fire for 310, the break-even percentage is 28%. You think they're actually going to be folding 40% of the time, so 40 is higher than 28, and as such, it is auto-profitable to fire in the spot, which means you should be firing more and more bluffs. However, when you bet 1600 or 2x over bet it, notice that the break-even percentage is 67%, you still think they're folding 40%, and as such, that is not going to be auto-profitable. Now, in the real world, obviously, most players are going to have some level of elasticity, which means they're going to continue differently against these two numbers, right? If you bet 310 versus 1600, maybe they continue more often against 310 and less often against 1600. So while you still will have the exact same break-even percentage based upon the size, the actual continuance frequency or folding frequency that you're comparing for auto profit numbers is going to or can possibly change. So keep that in mind when you're doing real world analysis. And for what it's worth, there are actually auto profit expirations within this workbook. I'm just going to gloss over it for now because I think you have the big picture idea, but if you want more work, definitely make sure to check out the workbook, splitsuit.com slash preflop to learn more and pick up your copy today. All right, the next concept that pros are definitely keeping track of in real time, maybe not exactly perfectly, but they at minimum have a rough count going on, are combos and also thinking about blockers and how they relate to combos. So combos essentially count how many different ways a certain hand can be made. So for instance, if you're trying to count how many combos of ace-king suited there are, there are four. Ace-king of hearts, ace-king of spades, ace-king of clubs, ace-king of diamonds. And then blockers essentially look at any known cards or cards you can visibly see to see if any combos need to get removed. So for instance, if we're still looking at ace-king suited example, let's just say that you have the ace of spades, you have ace of spades, queen of hearts. Well, based upon that, your ace of spades now makes it impossible for your opponent to have ace-king of spades that blocks out those combos. So if we flip over to a workbook, this time we'll use the post-flop workbook instead of the pre-flop and math one. This is a combo exercise. So essentially you have this spot with the board, you have your opponent's range. And if we plug all of that into Flopzilla real quick, here is the actual output. And by the way, if you're in Flopzilla and you wanna switch over to combo mode, just hit the tab key. And now all of these numbers are going to be looking specifically at combos instead of being in percentage or stat form. And one of the things that pros are are especially keeping track of throughout a hand, or at least trying to keep a rough idea of, are the number of combos of really, really strong hands their opponent can have right this moment. So in this situation, if we look at really strong hands, let's just say over pairs or better, notice that there simply are not very many of these, especially when compared to the overall number of combos that got to this street at roughly 193. And this is all before we factor in blockers, by the way. So let's just say, hypothetically, we had pocket tens in this situation. Well, notice that's gonna do even further removal and blocks 
some more of those strong combos, now your opponent really can't have a set of 10s, all of a sudden their two pair combinations are massively degraded, and that of course means that they have less and less super strong hands in their range right this moment. So by keeping track of the rough number of really nuttish combos in your opponent's range, especially if the density of those really strong hands gets very, very low compared to their overall range, that can be a great situation for you to start bluffing a tremendous amount. And this is how you can start tying the concepts together. You go back to your break-even percentage, you think about auto profit, is your opponent going to fold often enough? Hint, this is how you can mathematically start looking at that and finding that actual fold frequency from your opponent. This is exactly how you can start tying those concepts all together. And the final concept that I want to touch on today that all poker pros are keeping track of is EV. Now, almost no one is calculating this to the dollar by any stretch of the imagination in real time, more just eyeballing it and trying to make sure they take as many plus EV situations as possible, aka things that are expected to net them money in the long run, and trying to remove as many negative EV decisions from their playbook as humanly possible, again, things that are going to net them losses in the long run. Alright, so let's flick over to another example from the postflop workbook. This time we are on the river with Ace-10, our opponent decides to barrel it for $150 into a $300 pot, so there's currently $450 in the middle, and we have second pair and we're thinking about turning it into a bluff shove. So what do you think the EV might be? If you've never worked with EV before, this is going to be pretty much impossible to answer, but if you've done a couple of EV calculations, take a quick eyeball estimate and then let's run through the math together. So the basic EV formula, if you've never seen it before, is how often you win multiplied by how much you win when you do in fact win it, minus how often you lose times how much you're going to lose the times you do in fact lose it. And this can be expanded out greatly depending on all the different outcomes that can possibly happen. Now, in this situation, if you think about our bluff shove here, what are the possible outcomes that can happen? Well, we can shove, our opponent folds, and we win the pot right that moment. We could shove, our opponent continues, and we win that pot, or we shove, our opponent calls, and we lose that pot. And since we're talking about second pair here, let's just make the basic assumption that our opponent is not going to continue with second best hands. So essentially, if we shove and our opponent calls, we lose. Doesn't matter if we lose to top pair or if we lose to two pair, whatever it is, we're just going to make that assumption for the time being. So when we fill up everything inside of Flopzilla, here we are, and we notice that if we assume our opponent is always going to continue with top pair or better, don't worry if you agree with that or not, just work with it for the time being. That means that our opponent is going to continue against our shove 59% of the time and thus fold the other 41% of the time. And then we can plug all that into a quick calculator. Now, of course, in real time, you're not going to be able to pull out a calculator and actually do this. So the work or the idea is, is that by doing enough of this work off table, you can better estimate and eyeball this stuff in real time. And really that's what the best pros are doing. They're eyeballing it, they're estimating, they're saying, okay, I think this is going to be plus EV, I think it's going to be super plus EV, or I think this is going to lose me money and as such it's negative EV and I'd rather just not make that play instead. Because we could always just fold facing this bet on the river, we don't have to come along for a shove. Alright, so let's take a moment and fill out the complete calculation so we can see what the EV of this shove is. Let's go back and let's look at a couple different numbers. So first and foremost, how often is our opponent going to be folding right this moment? Well, we just calculated that in Flopzilla. It looks like they're folding 41% of the time. Fill this to 41. C will automatically calculate in the inverse. So 100% minus that number equals the C number. That's how often they're going to continue. The pot right this moment is $450. Ba, ba, ba. Perfect. Now, in this situation, we're expecting that when we shove and our opponent continues, we never win that pot. So because of that, we can just make the win percentage zero, which means that we're going to lose it 100% of the time when continued. And as such, how, what number you put in here does not matter. You could put 5 million or whatever number of zeros. It's not going to impact the EV because, again, you're never winning it. So it doesn't matter. What does matter, though, in this situation, because when we shove and get continuous from our opponent, we are never ahead, is how much we're losing in those situations. Situations. So we would lose, since our since we cover our opponent, we would lose 900 bucks plus their $150 bet. So we can just factor that in right here, 900 plus 150, cool. And you notice that our EV for this shove, based upon all the parameters and assumptions, is negative 435. 
so not super great. And if your first thought with this is, well, congrats, I'm not a human calculator and as such I can never do this in real time, I totally understand, but you can eyeball this, right? You can just say, okay, well, my opponent's folding less than half the time. When I do pick it up, I'm picking up uh, the, just the 450. I'm risking much more than that. And when I get continuance, I lose it 100% of the time. They are continuing a decent chunk and as such, you know it's gonna be negative EV. Maybe you can't tell that it's gonna be negative 435, that's fine, but at least you can identify a negative EV situation. But what if we change things up just ever so slightly, go back to Flopzilla and think, okay, well, actually, I think they're gonna continue with fewer combos than that. I don't think they're gonna continue with top pair every time. I think they're only gonna continue with two pair plus. Well, now all of a sudden they're folding much more, roughly 75% of the time, and that's going to change things at least slightly. So change this up to 75, and now all of a sudden you notice, even though we're still losing $1,050 every single time we shove and get called, we're not getting called nearly as often. And as such, this is actually positive to the tune of 75 bucks. So no one's expecting that in real time you're gonna be able to calculate this as exactly plus $75. However, if you can get better and better at eyeballing this, which is gonna be done through off-table reps and practice, it's gonna be much, much easier for you to identify situations where your opponent is folding more often, you can find more bluffs, you can make sure you're deleting more negative EV plays from your playbook, both pre-flop and post-flop, but it's by doing this kind of off-table work and understanding these big picture math concepts that you can really start to piece together an entire strategy rather than just kind of cobbling together whatever current strategy you have right this moment that might not be working for you as best as you'd like. So again, all of these poker concepts are things that pros 100% know, keep track of, and are trying to do basic calculations in real time. Again, no one's expecting you to be pixel perfect, but at least if you can get in the ballpark and you're getting better and better when your opponents are in no way, shape, or form trying to apply these things, it's gonna go a long way towards helping you develop a long, solid, stable edge. And that's gonna be super, super helpful and profitable in the long run. And that is gonna wrap it up for this video. Hope you enjoyed. If you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you back shortly with a brand new video. And in the meantime, good luck out there and happy grinding.